Mm. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And uh, thank you to the Sangha that's here on Zoom. Lovely to see you all. And hmm, the title of this talk is Still, comma, Flowing Water. <laughs> And that might seem like an oxymoron. Is it flowing or is it still? So this is what we're exploring. And uh, this is not my not my teaching. It's coming from the Venerable Ajahn Chah. And it's in this little book, little tiny book, um, <laughs> called uh, In the Shape of a Circle. And it's only got, it's got four Dharma talks in it that have been translated from Thai into English by Tanisaro Bhikkhu. And uh, in this one mm, Dharma talk that's called Still Flowing Water, Ajahn Chah teaches about, it's really interesting, it's kind of new thoughts for me, so I'm really uh, intrigued by this. Uh, he talks about how concentration and discernment are the same thing. And that that's interesting to me. I hadn't really thought of it this way before. Because in the Dharma, concentration is a particular grouping of practices uh that usually require like a longer retreat quite a bit of stillness and calm um um a lack of hindrances or strong hindrances uh pretty strong ethics and and container so that the mind can really settle into one pointed attention and then discernment means, mm, I don't know what the Thai word was that that has been translated into discernment here, but discernment is very much like insight or mm, seeing with discrimination, not like being discriminating, but discrimination into like what is an onward leading thought and what is... Uh, one that is keeping us caught in greed, hatred, and delusion, or discriminating what's what's skillful and what's not skillful. Um, discernment also means penetrating into the nature of things, like really seeing past surface presentation of mind states and 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 also things in the world, how things are. Um, discernment is a particularly perceptive way of seeing things, as according to Merriam-Webster or some such dictionary. Um, yeah, so these, to me, sound like quite different things, concentration and discernment. Uh, but Ajahn Chah in this Dharma talk is saying these are actually two of the same thing. So, yeah, he says, we, you know, we talk about, like I am, discernment and concentration as being these separate things, and actually they're the same. And he says, discernment is just the movement of concentration. That, that's very interesting. I love this. As I think of concentration as very still, Hmm. And um and as he says, you know, we can get into this idea that I've obviously picked up that concentration, well, I don't really think that, but anyways, concentration is not just done in seated meditation. That concentration, whether standing, sitting, lying down, or walking is all part of a concentration practice. Yes, it, like on a, 
but still for me my experience is like on a longer retreat like a three-month silent retreat that after there's a lot of stability and calm then there can really be a continuity of awareness of concentration as one is moving and doing various things but he's talking about it in a much more profound way than even that um discernment is just the movement of concentration i really like this so uh he goes on to say that um to practice concentration you don't have to imprison the mind it's really good or expect there to be total silence peaceful with no issues arising at all he says that's a dead person <laughs> Ajahn Chah obviously has a good sense of humor um not a live person and uh yes yeah, so this is really helpful so we don't need there to be perfect conditions total silence inner peace no stresses and issues and fluctuations and disturbances arising at all um i'll just read uh, okay he says um concentration is a firm intent focused on a single object what kind of object is a single object? The proper object. Ordinarily, we want to sit in total silence. People come and say, oh, I try to sit in concentration, but my mind won't stay put. First, it runs off one place, and then it runs off somewhere else. I don't know how to make it uh, stop still. And he says, it's not the sort of thing you can stop. I often say this when people are new to meditation, they're like really new. They say, you know, I just want to stop the mind. I've heard this so many times, or I just want to turn it off. Let's just be careful what we wish for, shall we? <laughs> because you don't want to turn the mind off. Mind is wonderful. It can make things up and imagine things and remember things and create things and uh wonder all these things so uh the mind is not the problem it's a lack of awareness that can dis discern and see oh mind is doing this mind is doing that and not needing to go for the ride so he says you're not trying to stop it from running for the running is what is where it's aware of itself people complain it runs off and I pull it back again. Then it walks off again and I pull it back once more. So they just sit there pulling back and forth like this. <laughs> you know, our meditation practice. I, I know we've all been there. Mine's running all over the place. And we're like, oh, no, begin again. Come back. And uh, he's pointing to a different experience here. He says, if we're meditating to find peace, we need to understand what peace is or we won't be able to find it. Uh, he, 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 there's lots of really interesting examples. He goes on quite a while about monkeys, but he ta um, this is when he, he shares about a pen. Um, for example, Suppose you brought a pen with you to the monastery today. So he's he's a monastic and teaching in a monastery, and people have come to hear this Dharma talk. It's a pen that you love, and um, it's an expensive one. And he quotes a price in, in Thai bots. And suppose that on your way here, you put the pen in your front pocket, but later you took it out and put it somewhere else, like your back pocket. 
Now, when you feel for it in your front pocket, it's not there. You panic. You panic because you don't see the truth of the matter and you get all upset. Standing, walking, coming and going, you can't stop worrying about your lost pen. Your misunderstanding causes you to suffer. What a shame, I've only had it for a few days and now it's lost. But then you remember, oh, of course, when I went to bathe, I put the pen in my back pocket. And as soon as you remember, you feel better already, even without seeing the pen. Just, ah, now I know where I love. And you see, you're happy already. You can stop worrying about your pen. You're sure about it now. And as you walk along, you run your hand over your back pocket, and there it is. Your mind was lying to you. Your pen wasn't lost, but the mind lied to you that it was. You suffered because you didn't know. Now, when you see the pen and your doubts are gone, your worries calm down. So we can see in this, story mm, uh, what's called samudaya the cause of suffering and the ending of suffering there was clinging to the valuable new special pen and then making all these stories up about it and not paying attention to what's actually happening but just ruminating on the pen and um, and then the pen is found or remembering happens. It's like instantly, oh, oh, everything's fine again. I had this today. We I taught a retreat on the weekend and I had borrowed somebody's book of poetry to share some poems. And then uh, I can't find it now. Oh. And I feel especially bad because it was somebody's book and it was their last copy of the book that they had written and uh, et cetera, looking all over the place, calling the center, emailing people, really feeling uh, regretful about it, like just couldn't place, where did it go? And so I just ordered another book and if it turns up, then I'll give that one to somebody else as a gift. But uh, it was interesting because at the same time, before the retreat, I'd been looking for my copy of the same book and I could not find it anywhere. But today I found my copy <laughs> it's like all over the place with the same, same as the pen. I didn't get into quite so much angst about it, but I was looking and, and um, wanting to find it. So he's, he, okay, so he says if we're meditating to find peace, we need to understand what peace is or we won't be able to find it. So the peace isn't uh, in the getting what we want, but in understanding, oh, I was clinging to that pen or that person or that weather or that place or other people being this way, all the things. Peace is not simply calming the mind or even temporarily calming what's called the defilements of greed, hatred, and delusion. These are kind of three groupings of the main things that uh, hook us and disturb us. Wanting, wanting things to be a certain way, Wanting things not to be another way. Greed, hatred, and delusion not seen clearly in all of its forms. So yes, we do need to practice and cultivate calming the mind, but not just for the sake of calming the mind. This is where we get a little stuck in the practice. It, we calm the mind so that the mind can become aware and then it will be at peace. It's through the shamatha vipassana. Calm awareness is what this practice is. I love this simile. He says that uh, 
Concentration is one kind of peace, but it's a peace like a, a rock sitting on grass. And when you pick it, pick the rock up, the grass will start to grow again. What a great image. So true. <laughs> it's only temporary. That's what concentration can be like. It's calming, it calms the weeds from growing for a while. But when you stop concentrating, it all comes back up again. And so the piece of discernment is never picking up the rock. The rock stays, the weeds don't grow again. So these two go hand in hand. He says they're the same thing, concentration and discernment. So we cultivate calm, but we must have insight or discernment or mm, clearly seeing into the nature of things, especially our attachments, especially seeing the mind and the suffering it creates from its confusion and clinging. And <laughs> Yeah, so the practice, we, we, it's partly human nature, but also our human nature has the potential to see clearly and to awaken. So we're not just going to write it off like, oh, well, that's human nature. But the practice of clinging to what is good and rejecting what is bad is not seeing clearly, is is not with discernment. Uh, and he talks about, um, he uses the image of a, a knife. <laughs> Doesn't everyone have a knife on their meditation table or their computer table? <laughs> no, I don't usually. Um, where's his knife story? I'll share. Uh, this knife has a blade, the back of the blade, and a handle. And when you pick it up, can you lift only the blade? Or only the back of the blade? Or only the handle? The handle is the handle of the knife, the back, the back of the knife, the blade, the blade of the knife. And when you pick up the knife, you pick up all three parts together. In the same way, if you pick up what's good, what's bad must follow. This make people feel stressed the way I'm playing around with this knife. Sorry. <laughs> I'll hold it still. <laughs> if we pick up happiness, if we cling to happiness, then suffering will follow along. If we push away what is uncomfortable, difficult, painful, stressful, then we're also pushing away what is good, what is wholesome, what is onward leading. These come together. And the point is clinging or not clinging. Ah, the point. Da -da -da, the point of the play. Good one. Um, so if you grab onto what's good, what's bad will follow. <laughs> this is certainly true. He goes on at another place. Some people complain, oh, I can't meditate. It's too irritating. Whenever I sit down, I think of this and that. I think of my house and my family. I can't do it. I've got too much bad uh, karma. Mm. Too many defilements showing up. And I need to let all this run, it, run itself out first, and then I'll come back and try meditating. <laughs> he says, go ahead, just try it. Try waiting until your bad karma runs out. <laughs> Guy's got a good sense of humor. I like it. Yes, 
of course it doesn't work this way <laughs> just waiting till it uh, runs itself out because if we're not using discernment and stillness and calm it's certainly not going to run itself out it's just got its own fuel and will continue <laughs> So he the the title of this uh, I was reading this this Dharma talk and, and it goes on for quite a while and it's not till the very last paragraph where he refers to the title of the talk which is still comma flowing water and um, so this is an image that he's using to talk about this experience of concentration and discernment you know and we we can picture we can think about still water and what that looks like and what that might feel like in the body or in the mind ah calm settled peaceful and we also can picture and know what it feels like in the body and the mind and energy flowing water. And, and even choppy water, you know, wavy water. We know what that feels like. Ah, maybe that feels unpleasant. And he's talking about, and then he says, if your mind is truly peaceful, well, I'll read his whole paragraph. Have you ever seen flowing water? Have you ever seen still water? If your mind is peaceful, it's like still flowing water. I love how that wakes me up. Like, wow, still and flowing. It just wakes you up when you hear something, you know, that's not the usual language. Um... He says, you've, you've only seen flowing water and still water. You've never seen still flowing water. Right there, right where your thinking can't take you, where your mind is still, but can still develop discernment. When you look at your mind, it'll be like flowing water and yet still. It looks like it's still. It looks like it's flowing. So it's called still flowing water. That's what it's like. And that's where discernment can arise. This is lovely. So the mind is still, but can still is still able to, too many stills in there, um, have discernment of what's coming and going. Is there clinging? Is there a real version um, not shutting life out? Yeah. Some helpful images I find of uh, what our practice is. Shamatha Vipassana, calm, concentration with insight. awake awareness that has enough stability and presence to know what's coming and going without being swept along in the current. Let's do it. So we'll have a practice now. Adjust your posture if you need to change your lighting or get a shawl or a cushion. Okay. Uh, so for those that are new to the practice or joining us, it may be helpful to know this will be a 25 minute practice. Mm. 
And you can take some time to see if you need any movements or adjustments, any touch or stretch, so that you're not forcing yourself to become still before your system is ready. It can be helpful to look around your space so that you feel acclimatized and that you're in a safe environment or as safe as it is possible for you at this time. And feeling a sense of width if you're sitting upright through the legs and feet and pelvis and a sense of uprightness through the spine and the crown of the head. And finding a posture for the eyes that is supportive for you. For some it's eyes closed. For others it may be just eyes resting downward. And for some, it's helpful to let the eyes rest on a object of beauty or calm or peace that's nearby <clears throat> in order to cultivate uh, calm. It's helpful to not be looking around and entertaining and delighting the eyes. It's just going to uh, create more disturbance. So let the eyes find a resting place. And as he talks about in this Dharma talk, but I didn't share that part, the importance of our values, our precepts, our ethics that are the foundation of our practice. So feel into what values you bring to your life. What, do you, what are your guiding stars of how you want to be in the world? You know that we may... Uh, at times certainly be unskillful, but we come back and we begin again and we um, have these wise intentions. They may be to not cause harm to yourself and others, to speak with kindness and truth, to not be taking what isn't freely given, to not cause harm with our greed, and delusion, to not be heedless or unaware, so just take a few moments to reflect on your values or your precepts that are the ground of your practice. And then it can be helpful to then move into a few minutes of some cultivation of kindness, metta bhavana practice. So to touch into your deepest wishes that we all have for happiness, safety, wellness, and peace. So even though the mind might jump in with stories like, that's not going to happen for me, or what does that even mean? All these thinking thoughts, just touch the wish 
the deepest seed in the heart center with these phrases, may I be happy. May I be well in body and mind. May I be safe from harmful thoughts and actions internally and externally. May I be peaceful and free of suffering. May I be happy. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be peaceful. And you can use your own words or just the felt experience of this kind attention and cultivation of wise intention with yourself. May I be happy. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be peaceful. So these ways of recalling our values as our foundation and our kind intentions, metta, with ourselves can help set the stage for moving towards calming, soothing the heart, body, mind. And now we'll take, if it's helpful to you, two or three slightly deeper breaths so that you feel movement in either the belly or the chest or the ribs. And then allow the breath to return to natural breath, not pushing or pulling or controlling the breath. Body knows how to breathe, was doing a fine job. And we just want to now feel the sensation in the body of breathing. You might most easily feel some movement in the belly, expanding, contracting. Or some might more easily feel movement in the center of the chest, lifting and resting. And some folks might more easily feel the sensation of the breath at the nostrils. So just choose one of those three places. And for the remainder of the practice, that will be the place that you return to.
And for these next few minutes in silence together, just turn up the light of curiosity and attention on that sensation at the place you chose to feel your breath. Pay attention to the beginning and the length, the turning of the breath, the exhale, the ending. Each breath. Let your attention really rest with ease and relaxation, but also curiosity, like a paintbrush, a soft brush, brush touching the whole length, brushing on the breath, up and down, or in and out, just at the place where you're feeling it. Full breath. And we calm the mind so that it can become aware. And if the mind is aware, it will be at peace. So we're resting with the breath. And we include, this is the still, flowing water, we include awareness of when the attention is picking up off of the breath into some other thoughts, worries, sounds, sensations, desires, doubts, everything. We include knowing that. without being swept downstream.
when the attention has been swept off downstream, before you quickly bring it back to the breath, or don't bring it quickly back to the breath, take a moment to notice, oh, what was happening? Planning, worrying, sleeping, wanting. Just take a moment to include knowing what that flow was. Still flowing water, include all of it. without needing to pick up or hold on to or push away anything. Because if we pick up the handle of the knife, we're also picking up the blade. Discernment is just the movement of concentration. If there's restlessness or boredom or sleepiness, include knowing that. If 
in the stillness that knows. Imagine that when you hear the bell in a moment, this is signifying the beginning of the practice. As you begin to move or open your eyes or bow that you feel like now you are continuing and beginning the practice of as Venerable Ajahn Chah says that concentration is not just done in seated meditation but when standing, sitting, lying down and walking. Mm. Uh. 
There was something I remembered in the practice that I was going to say, but now it's gone. Can we just see? Mm. No. It passed. So, uh, mm, I hope there's something fruitful for you there to explore about discernment and its importance of uh, not just temporary calming and temporary concentration, but uh, maintaining awareness um, through our practice. Thanks for being with us. <laughs>